Hello, and welcome to New You Wow Going Places podcast, where we celebrate our achievements and connections in the community. As the founder of New You Wow, I help driven women crush fear and anxiety to become unstoppable with personalized power coaching. And today, we are honored to have the esteemed Deb Charity, founder of Art and Health Awareness Foundation, Amen Clinic's professional affiliate, brain health coach, and Vice President of Youth Corporation, Inc. How are you today? Oh, Yvonne, it's so good to see you. I'm excited. Wonderful. We are so happy. I'm great, I'm great. You know, it's just fantastic to have all of your experience and your knowledge brought to our audience. So we thank you very much. And we always tend to start with a bit of an icebreaker. So what's something interesting about yourself that most people do not know? A hidden gem. Oh, that I was born uh, as an ambidextrous person. Nice. And when I was three years old, my aunt, my only aunt, was a teenager, and she was teaching me to write. And the story that I heard, and I didn't hear this story until I was in my thirties. Okay. In corporate America we would have regular training classes. And part of the training was to determine whether you were right-eyed or left-eyed, and it it all goes into perception and how you meet people. And I would always come up right in the middle, analytical and creative, and I didn't understand it. I thought, okay, let me take the test again. It's always the same. And so then I learned from my aunt who was quiet, but analytical. And you know, she was creative too, but she'd say, I taught you to to write. Really? I didn't know that. Her name was Ruth. Aww. And um, when I saw that she was writing with her left hand, I started doing that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And you know, as you shared that, it makes me think that I can still see it. I believe I was four years old at the time, but we had an uncle visiting while my dad was stationed in Kentucky. And he taught me how to tie my shoe. And I was livid because I just wanted to go play with the rest of the kids. And he's like, no, you're gonna stay right here. He had me sitting on the edge of a little stoop. And he's like, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. So he, he would do it, then he'd say, now you do it. And that back and forth exchange, I think it's so instrumental when extended family can help you solidify who you are. And then especially when you don't really fully get it until later in life. <laughs> that is so wonderful. And we're Oh, what's that? One other thing when I when I was three. Uh-huh. Uh don't I don't know how I knew this, but my mom was having a ba- another baby. Oh. I remember the thought process. I knew my ABCs and I had begun to write. And I remember thinking, and I told her, I want a little baby brother named Abra. You <laughs> no. Matthews and she said, what? Abraham? I said, no. So she wrote on paper. I just learned this recently. She wrote Abraham and then she wrote Abra. And she said, this meaning Abraham. I said, no, that. And I remember thinking my name is Deborah. I know my ABCs. Deborah, that doesn't sound right. Cabra, that doesn't sound right. Okay. I want his name to be Abraham. Now what kind of mother? Let's a three-year-old name a baby, you know? <laughs> so when I'm doing stuff and my husband who has a different personality will look at me, I see him, that's just the three-year-old coming out of me. You know? <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, no, I think it's instrumental that, you know, all our listeners resonate with, you start becoming who you are from the womb. And it's gonna manifest for different ones at different times. But, you know, a lot of times it's just suppression. People are hiding who they really are. So when you can recall these memories and experiences, it's like you're able to embrace who you are early. And it gives you the freedom to just keep growing. So I think that's beautiful. It's funny too, um, when you mentioned the exchange with your mom. So my mom and my mother-in-law, Valerie and Jean, who were so instrumental to you coming on the show today. um, My mom tells me this funny story about she was reading to me just because, you know, I was the first of four. So she would just read books to me. And then she said, I started repeating them back. So she thought I'd memorize them at the age of three or four. 
And then she started handing me books she hadn't read and I could read them. And she was like, what's happening? But again, when you have strong mothers that spend time with you and have exchanges with you, they don't realize those building blocks are going to turn into amazing things later. So to all the moms out there that are so instrumental to helping our communities be strong, spend as much time as you can, as early as you can with your children. It helps you leave a legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you shared with me, Deb, that you also are a Verizon Communications Voice and Data Systems Engineer, Major Project Implementer, and Market Management Retiree. So in essence, you've got more than 30 years of social services, business, organizational and leadership development, public speaking, art, music, healthcare advocacy. What led to your decision to pursue a career in such diversified fields? You know what, you do your homework and that's one of the things that I wanted to encourage our listeners. Each time I thought about what I'd like to do and I learned early that your skills are transferable. Yes, ma'am. When I saw that you had majored in speech pathology, okay, because one of the ways we communicate is through our speaking. Although the majority of our communication is nonverbal. Later on, I want to share with you some data that show you probably already know this. Absolutely. 80% doesn't come out of our mouths. That's exactly right. The expression, it's not what I said, it's what you heard. So I started in social services and normally they don't put new workers in intake. Okay. This was back in the early 70s. And during the interview, I did something that probably would not be done today um, based on the rules that they give you. And they said, why do you think you can do intake? I said, because I know how to think on my feet. I'm accustomed to meeting my neighbors. My community is diverse. Nice. And listening to them and starting conversations where they are. So after 13 and a half years in social services and foster care background. Every day I'd come home and hug my babies when I would look at these case records and I'd go to the start of the case record and often these foster children had as a start in their medical records, infant Smith, right? And then what was the diagnosis? Failure to thrive, Mm. which means and that the baby often will be losing weight. And where did, from where did that come? Often a bottle has been propped because the mama's off doing her thing, True. whoever the caregiver is. And so they get creative and prop the bottle on another pillow. Mm-hmm. And what experienced pediatricians will do or doctors will do is hold the baby and hold the back of the head. If the back of the head is flat, that means that the baby hasn't had enough skin hunger. Oh. They, they haven't had that 12 inches of eye contact with the, with the caregiver. Right. And that's where it starts. And then when you see this maybe three inch thick case where this child has gone from one foster home to another to another because they've not connected, they're not thriving emotionally. Mm. I, mentors of Florence Brissette. And for those who know, if you were to look in the yearbook of 2005, Mm -hmm. uh, you would read a part of her experience. She's from Guyana. Nice. And she taught me about skin hunger. The biggest organ that we have is our skin. Right. And there is such a need when it comes to a child's being able to thrive, to have that skin hunger, to be held, to be touched. Beautiful. That's why when kids go to school and they come home, it's like, what happened? She didn't give me a smiley face. That's real important. And how Piaget, uh, P-I-A-J-E-T, I I think it's, no, G-E-T is what his name is spelled, Mm -hmm. in early studies. And he wondered whether or not babies could feel emotion. Mm -hmm. So what he did was to have smiley faces. This, this is where the origin of the smiley faces is. And he would do a symmetrical face 
with a smile. Okay. You do the up and the symmetrical eyes where they're supposed to be, nose where it's supposed to be, and put the mouth on the side. And the baby's pupils would constrict. Mm. When he showed the smiley face with which we're familiar, the pupils <laughs> would dilate. Mm -hmm. And then when he would put the mouth at the top, the eyes on the side, again, the baby's pupils would change. They would constrict. Corresponding. The baby couldn't say, you know, that looks crazy to me. <laughs> they, were, they were telling folks. And that's how we, we got into the smiley face and why it's so important. And it shows that this is something that comes from before birth, if you will. That's, it's that's a part of our, it's a part of our, our makeup, part of our design. Beautiful. And you know, I'm glad you shared that. It helps me understand my hubby has a smile that when a baby's in front of him, they go bananas. But it's all because his smile is so big. And I tell him, you've got the perfect symmetry with that smile. So yeah, babies go crazy around him. And you know, it's kind of our tendency as adults when you're holding the baby to make the faces, to emphasize your smile. So our creator in his immense wisdom made sure we know what to do right from the start. Yeah. So then I had um, three friends. Okay, I was in social services for 13 and a half years. Okay. Nice, nice. And three different friends approached me. They said, you know what? You need to go to the phone company. I said, really? Because you know, you got to be in social work because you love it, not because you're going to make a lot of money. And I said, really? Hmm. So after three people, three friends, all diverse, shared that with me, I thought, and one of the clerks who worked at the phone company, my know, made as much money as I did as a supervisor. I said, okay, let's <laughs> see. So <clears throat> folks said, why would you change? You've been in social services for so long. Right. And then that's when you learn, your skills are transferable. You learn to listen to people, determine their needs, Absolutely. And then if you have regulations from the government or even when it comes to, uh, for instance, I worked at what was at that time CMP Telephone Company, which became Bell Atlantic, which became Verizon. Okay. You have guidelines, state approved guidelines by which you have to go to provide services. Right? Okay. So your skills are transferable. So my first client when I went over into uh, the phone company, if you will, was the agency where I used to work. <laughs> and when you understand the business of your customers, you can do a much better job. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed what I did. And uh, they tell me that I was good at it, so. That helps. <laughs> but so. you know, kudos to you for taking the leap because a lot of times we're creatures of habit and we get used to doing the same thing a certain way because it's comfortable. So imagine if you didn't listen to those three friends and pursue the opportunity, how your life would have turned out so differently. But yeah. it almost went full circle with your first client being the agency where you used to work. That's great. And What's interesting too is going back to this matter of having transferable skills. Yes. Some folks will get training or education in a particular field and their attitude is i am a mechanic whatever they might be yeah, stay in the box mm -hmm. stay in the box because it's safe there okay so you respect that you know mm -hmm. uh, something interesting one of my clients uh, was an international airport and i was assigned what's called a cutover they wanted a new communication system well they really didn't start out wanting a new communication system. They had a complaint. The complaint was valid. And I was selected to go out and talk with this client. Okay. This international airport. Okay. Ooh, okay. So <laughs> as they're explaining their complaint, which was valid, I said, well, you know, had you ever thought about using the same finances to upgrade your system, All right? Okay. So they said, you know, yeah, we probably need to do that. So 
when I come back to the office, folks are like, okay, how did it go? My, you know, my manager's like, how did it go? Did you resolve it? Because you don't want folks writing a state corporation commission. You got to stop and address all this. Of course. And that's valid. So I said, they decided that they wanted a new system. What? So when it comes to learning to get along with people, I was in a position to depend on other departments to get my work done. None of them reported to me. Okay. And you have to make friends and you have to show them why it is in their best interest to work with you. All right. So valuable. So what I found is if you continue to tell the story, let them see your vision. And if they don't see it as one recent brain health coaching instructor said, let them borrow your glasses. <laughs> okay. Hey. The other thing is this, when folks have, I'm getting into what I wanted to share with you in some of the slides, but anyway. That's okay. Okay, what folks often forget is, it's a good thing to treat people as if they're in a relationship with you because you don't know when you're gonna have to come back. I mentioned Florence Frizette, and one of the things she said in her Guyanese, Guyanese accent is, don't muddy your water. You may have to drink it. I said, ooh, yeah. I need to write that down. Okay. So make sure that just like you will tip a person when you go to a restaurant and they give you good service and you give them more than the typical 15%, mm -hmm. tip the person. The tip could be, you know what? Ms. Nobles, I am so impressed with what you've done to help me. I need to have your manager's name. Mm -hmm. And make sure that you write that manager. Mm -hmm. So how does that help in a huge organization like um, Bell Atlantic, 60,000 employees, right? When I write a letter to your boss, no, I'm not writing a letter to your boss. I'm going to write a letter to your vice president. I mean, my vice president, it will trickle down and I'll ask, would you please in your next organization meeting, share this with Ms. Nobles in the group. That's so good. next time I need something, I would go to someone in that organization, maybe because they're in a different territory, different responsibilities, but the word has gotten out. Mm -hmm. Why people like to be recognized for what they do? Yes. And that can be equivalent to your giving a tip at a restaurant. And a lot of times we don't get that. Mm. Mm. Even when it comes to our doctors, mm -hmm. you go in, ask your doctor, how are you doing today? And several doctors have said, I've never had anybody to ask how I'm doing. And I'm, in, I'm sincere, I want to know. Mm -hmm. Right? So those people skills are so important. Now, I wanted to tell you about, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. You're fine. <laughs> I wanted to share um, the screen, if I can do that. Yeah, in fact, um, as you're pulling that up, I was curious, because you were speaking on that element of professional journey. Do you have any specific, um, any roadblocks, any speed bumps that you encountered on your drive to success? Something that you overcame, because you mentioned the one company, the International Airport there, that had the problem that you turned into a purchase Yes. Is some other really, really big element that came along that you were so proud of achieving, getting past the hurdle. Yeah. Oh, let me finish telling you about the, the airport. I'm excited, folks, but I'm trying to be cool, okay? <laughs> ask you about this. So at any rate, right. <laughs> international, just get this. International airport, I and it had to be what's called a flash cut. Okay. Like doing a kidney transplant. You know, you got to keep the kidney, you know. You, get, you can't let this thing sit in the refrigerator for six weeks, right? When you blink, it's got to be done. All right. So I negotiated with the other departments involved to help to have a parallel system, to have all the circuitry, all the lines, all the everything in place up front. And I had from midnight until 4 a.m. to do this cutover because those planes start moving. You think about it, when you take an early morning flight, when you get on the flight at 5.50, they're already there up and running. Right so, yeah. Can you imagine? That's 
this could be a hot mess and it, might, well, it would not be pretty. Okay. So I'm there at midnight and the guys, the folks there who are walking the boots on the ground are doing their thing. Okay. And so I'm talking with the administrator of this international airport, Ken Scott was his name. And we're talking about dogs showing that personal interest. And we both have Cocker Spaniels. And we just had this conversation because I knew the guys were doing this work. All right, 12, 15, we were done. 15 minutes? 12, 15, because again, I helped the other departments wear my glasses, nice. wear my vision. And then I get a phone call one day and I'm looking at the, okay, Ken Scott's calling me, what's wrong? He said, Deb, now mind you, we're the contractor. Okay. Said, I want to invite you to lunch. I said, okay. And I want to invite everybody who was involved in that cutover to lunch. Oh, fantastic. When do you see the customer inviting the contractor to lunch, right? And he said, um, and I want you to give me the guest list. Wow. So we went to the airport to an area where we didn't know existed and it had this really nice dining room. They served us. And what I did, Yvonne, was to make sure that every person, I don't care if you wrote one service order, I included every single person. Why? Because it made a difference, okay? Now step back to social services. You're both the caseworker. <clears throat> Be ugly or inappropriate with a clerk. They can fix your box real good. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. I, right. Going back to the days when we had all the paper you know, cases before everything was online. Let you get a call from the mayor's office because somebody has complained, mm. whether it's legitimate or not. And you've been ugly. Maybe you come in and you don't speak because see, they're they're beneath you. You say you have that attitude. You don't know where those case records are, and she just might take her sweet little time. It's called passive aggression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She might take her sweet little time finding that case record for you, and you're sweating bullets, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you learn to acknowledge everybody's importance and what you're doing. So we ended up with. I'm afraid to tell. Them. 34 people for lunch. That's beautiful. They all dressed up and came to lunch. And I said, wait a minute, we've got to take pictures. So what did they do? That built an extended team. And keeping in mind that these folks didn't work for me, I wasn't responsible for their paychecks. But that was, that was a huge accomplishment. To That's be fantastic. You know, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. Acknowledgement, you know. What happens in so many arenas, and you know, my hubby and I have experienced it. We'll take friends with us to restaurants, of course, pre-pandemic, and met out there. Oh yeah. And they are so blown away at the service that we get. But it's because from the very first interaction with the person bringing your food, when you acknowledge them as human, and you just really, really connect, it's so rare that it's unforgettable. So they're looking for you to come back. Or, you know, I've been in many, many different roles in corporate America, and I always make a point to acknowledge the janitor, the custodian, the person who, it's so integral, but they're not seen. Because imagine if they just didn't show up for work. I was in New York when there was a big strike on sanitation. So imagine what it's like in a metropolitan area when all your garbage ain't going nowhere. <laughs> So it's the people that people tend to undervalue that once they get that that love connect and they know that they're seen as important, they can deliver the moon, you know? So yeah, I agree with you. I'm so glad that you were able to deliver that to everyone that was instrumental to that success. Cause you're right, one little work order misplaced and you couldn't have done what you did, you know? Uh -huh. you know? That's great. But yeah, you did mention before we started, you have a beautiful uh, shout out to mentors, meet to mentors if you wanna share. So I'm gonna just stand by, let you share your screen, and then I'm gonna put it in a view where everyone can see it. Okay. Hang on. You're ready to start. 
Okay. Let me uh, get over here. Yeah, and because we've talked about so many things, I want to bounce around a little bit. Let me move over here. Okay. For this, amazing. Now, if I want, I first want to talk about Gran. Gran was one of my mentors. Gran was my grandfather, and we started out by calling him. I was the first grandchild. It was granddaddy. I was like, that, I'm just going to call him Gran because he is Gran. <laughs> February 2nd, uh, 1902. And Gran had blue gray eyes and very fair skin, uh, thin lips, thin nose, and high cheekbones. And he would say, I hate my color. Oh. As a little girl, I said, Grant, why do you say that? And he would never answer. By the time I was a teenager, I understood why he said that, mm -hmm. because I got to know our history. I later learned that his grandfather, who had been a slave, was selected to teach the children on the plantation to read, all right? The plantation owner's children. Wow. At night, they did something that was against the law. They allowed him to teach the children of color to read. His grandfather was mm -hmm. not that privileged. So I lived with my grandfather and his third wife, uh, his first wife, my mom's mother, had died when she was nine years old. And then he was married to somebody else. And then his third wife, okay. So, um, talk about birth order, that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> and we lived in the corner house and the cemetery wall was next to our house. So when you got to our house, you had to turn left or right because that was the end of the street. And he had a porch. <laughs> we sit on the porch and anytime his eyes met anybody's eyes as they were driving past the house, he'd say, hey boy. Yvonne, one day I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, Grant, why do you speak to everybody who comes by this house? What'd he say? He just looked at me as if I were crazy. <laughs> and he didn't say anything, he just looked at me. And now I do the same thing, you know? Wow. So, and one of his expressions was, you can't make chillin' into grown folks. No matter how you try, you can't make them. Mm -hmm. Now, he was the kind of person like this, right? Um, bored is summertime and it's humid in Southern Virginia. And I'm thinking, oh, I need to help. These older people, and they were younger than I am now, but they were in their 60s and they shouldn't have to do things that a child can do. So I don't know if you have ever seen or heard of Bon Ami soap. Okay, listeners, Google Bon Ami soap. It was like having a bar of Ajax or Comet or some kind of cleanup like that. Okay. okay. You get a rag and you get some water and you rub the Bon Ami soap on the windows and you let it dry a little bit and then you get newspaper, okay. ball it up, right? And that's how you get this off the windows. Well, I was a bit heavy handed, still am, and I couldn't get the Bon Ami soap off the windows. It's like, this is not working. So I go and get the water hose. Oh. Plug up the water hose, and he had taught me how to put my thumb across the opening, you know, the, the uh, water hose. The water so, pressure? Yeah, thank you for that. So I'm spraying the windows with my thumb over the water hose. The water's coming on. We didn't have any insulated windows. And what I didn't know was that the water was seeping into the living room. Oh my. Yeah. And so <laughs> my grandmother tried to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Water all, can you imagine just seeping down the wall and, and running into the living room? His attitude was, well, what was you trying to do? <laughs> so with Grant, if you could tell him what you were trying to do, he wouldn't discipline you. You were trying to help. That was his attitude. Wow. I learned a lot about that. Now, Miss Eva, now, I wrote Mrs. Eva, but it was like Miss Eva, all right? Now, she was born in 1900. She had finished the third grade, and at the age of 59, she decided to return to school, fourth grade. Fabulous. Night school. Now, I have to admit that I was also in the fourth grade and I wasn't patient. She asked me if I would help her with her homework. Can you imagine that? 
to learn division. So she was a classmate of yours. Yeah, but she was going at night, see? And I thought, why didn't she know how to do that? And I, you know, I'm sad to say I, I didn't have any patience. And I'm hoping one day that I'll be able to share that with her based on the promises that we know are concrete. So here's what she taught. Here are the subjects that she taught. I don't know why we have the green screen. She taught me diversity. Mm -hmm. I was like, Debbie, you've got to look at things more than one way. Mm -hmm. Now, today we call that diversity, right? And then she taught behavior modification. I had a fashion of leaving on the lights. And we're talking about <laughs> adults who were in the depression, mm -hmm. wiping off aluminum foil and saving soap slithers. You didn't have any spray and wash. You had an old toothbrush and soap and water, and, and you need your soap slithers. So rather than continue to tell me to cut off the lights, what girlfriend did was go through the house and take the light bulbs out of the ceilings. Oh my goodness. I'd go into a room and I'm trying to flicker, you know, cut on the light. Nothing's happening. <laughs> so then I have to go over and find a towel, <laughs> get a chair and move the light bulb from one room to another. I they guess I taught you a lesson, huh? Behavior modification. <laughs> Okay, the other thing is this, customer services, where she also taught me, she said, Debbie, you know, she said, Debbie, put a handle on people's names. I'm like, a handle? A handle? On okay, now how does that translate to today? You call customer service, you're talking to the bank, and these young, you can tell they're younger and they're saying, uh, uh, Deborah, um, we want to look at your account. So finally I said, you know what, what's your name? Carl, okay, Carl, it's nice to meet you. How long have you been with the bank? I said, you don't have to answer. I've been with this bank longer than you are old. <laughs> you really would appreciate it if you did not presume to call me by my first name. Oh. Okay, you get permission. So that was another one of those lessons. Mm. Don't go so far forward that you can't go back. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. We know that from human behavior and from etiquette that in a very few seconds, people decide whether or not you're somebody with whom they want to do business. You know how many seconds it is? I don't want to put you on a, on a spot. Um, I, three to seven seconds. Seven seconds pass. look at that. Three to seven seconds. They've already determined whether or not they want to do business with you. And as you and I discussed before we started, on 70 to 93% of our communication is nonverbal, mm. right? Okay, so I made a note, since people are concerned about FICO scores, people have FICO scores. And you know, if you mess up your FICO score, it takes a while to rebuild. Oh, there's me, he was <laughs> Hi, puppy. It's okay, it's okay. All right, get it out. You got it? You good? Are you, you going to let Miss Deb continue? Let me see him. Oh, is he in the cage? I'm going to see if he's going to come over. Hey, Papa, you want to come over? Yeah, he's looked like way out of reach. Oh, okay, okay. So you want to grab him. You keep going. Oh, good, okay. So even when it comes to people, realize that we have FICO scores. And it's better to maintain the score than to try to read the, oh, that's a pretty puppy. Oh, hi, puppy. What's your puppy's name? S'mores. S'mores. You did tell me it's S'mores. Oh. Say hi. Say, I was just keeping mommy safe. I thought something was going on. He's trying to get in this house. Oh. <laughs> okay. Too cute. Too cute. The other point that I mentioned on uh, this slide is have a mixed portfolio. Well, what in the world does that have to do with communication? Okay. They tell you now, have a mixed portfolio. Old people used to say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely. So when it comes to people, make sure that the folks who are in your circle are not all your age. And if I can say the way I normally would say it, I'm talking to my girlfriend, say, you know what? I don't need nobody dumber than me. <laughs> And people won't tell you what you don't know. And you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. right? So you wanna have a mix of folks. And that goes back to the whole mentoring thing. 
earlier I had mentioned my Aunt Ruth, who was a teenager when I was born. Right. I would say to everybody, if you're left-handed, spend some time writing or eating with your non-dominant hand. It's a whole new world on that other side of your brain. It's all right. <laughs> you can tap into that when you use your other hand to do some skill. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. And wasn't um, it unfortunate that early on in the American school system, left-handedness was discouraged? You know, the teachers, uh, you know, beating their hand with rulers or children being forced to wear a dunce hat or criticized, but they were the ones that were creative. So it's mind blowing, really mind blowing. It is. They didn't understand. They they read something in the Bible, you know, it said the right hand of favor, the left hand is from the devil. Okay. They didn't understand. They didn't understand. So we mentioned um, when we were talking earlier, it's not what you said, it's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And I often said, well, all I meant was, okay, but she's telling you that that's not how she took it. Mm -hmm. So that's where humility comes in to say, okay, what does this mean when I say X, Y, Z to you? What, what does that mean? And if we listen, if we're humble enough to listen, folks will tell us what they need to hear and they will tell us how they best communicate. Mm -hmm. what, what a lifesaver. This I found eye opening, Yvonne, that technology is the cigarettes of this century. Mm. Right, okay. Um, during this pandemic, the loneliness and isolation is equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's like, mm. oh, okay, so we need to be able to touch. So the term social distance would be better uh, expressed as keep physical distance, but going out of our way to have social connections with people. Sending a card in the mail, do you know what that does? If a person just gets a card or a phone call, yeah. right? I, I was just thinking about you. Wow, wow. Not everything is a text and not everybody needs to see the top of your head while you're talking. Right? <laughs> so if you're using your um, desk, space for work, even if, whether you're working from home or working in the office, smile That's and awesome. have a mirror so that you can see what you look like because it comes through in your voice. Mm -hmm. It's like the person uh, who says, she said she was all right. You didn't hear the voice inflection. I'm, I'm fine. Is she fine? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's another point, because um, I know I want to be a bit sensitive to our time. It's but it comes to, we're good. We're good. Okay. When it comes to customer service, still under the umbrella of communication, mm -hmm. always let the other person hang up first. Yeah. Why? Why would that make sense? You don't want them to hear that silence. They're your customer. You, you hear that, that let them leave you in a positive frame. Always let the other person hang up first. Now, here's a, here's a big one, okay. Another rule, a quote rule. This young man is obviously engaged in the conversation and he's using hands-free mm -hmm. speakerphone mm -hmm. without Permission, this cannot, now let me, let me change that. It would be better if you ask. And that's one of the things that I learned in communications. Always ask permission, is it okay to put you on speakerphone? Why? You don't know who else is in the room True. with me. Sure. Well, I do that, See, then you've made yourself first rather than the other person. Well, this is more comfortable for me or I'm sitting right beneath the air blower in this conference room. So, John, is it possible for you to move that conference set to another part of the room? Already you've taken up a whole lot of time just by who you are rather than yielding to what's more comfortable for the other person. That is good. Mm -hmm. Right? You walk into somebody's house, especially if they live in a city, 
they allow you into the home and you look and you see a stack of shoes lined up on the side, why would we presume that it's okay to walk in and keep on our shoes? Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. Where do you want me to put my shoes? Right. That nonverbal, you see the shoes lined up <laughs> and that just enhances the relationship because the message of course is that you're considerate of them. You're concerned about giving respect to their preferences and their space. That's so true. One set of rules. Often we have two sets, one for us and one for other people. And one set of rules works much better in dealing with people. Then you can build trust and you can build relationships. Now, one of our surrogate sons sent me this picture and can everybody see this? This picture is of, you can see this, man's hairy legs <laughs> and some red high heel shoes. Mm -hmm. And um, the title of uh, the slide I gave is Empathy. Mm -hmm. So he said, I know how you feel. No, you don't. I have gone through the same thing. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't know how I feel. And it's like one obstetrician told me that, um, she said, you know, Deb, I was delivering babies, doing C-sections, before my husband and I ever had children. She said, when the first pain hit me, I was like, whoa, they didn't tell me it was gonna feel like this. So she said, after she went through the experience, mm -hmm. and she said, and my first child, long labor, and I had to have a C-section. She said, then I was a better physician. Wow. So when I'm a man is attempting in an appropriate manner to encourage, or well, I'll, I'll use the word shepherd, right? Uh, encourage a shepherd, a woman, you know, can you wear her shoes? Mm -hmm. Wear a size 11 and she wears a seven. So you might try wearing her shoes. Yep. Then you can come back to her, right? Yep. Then you can come back to her and you can talk and encourage her because then she gets it that you are understanding how she feels. Yeah, one of my favorite definitions of empathy that we've seen in our publications is your pain in my heart. So it, it's not just about imagining the experience, but you actually feel what the person is going through and what's on their plate. And yeah. you, know, you put the shoes on, you walk that mile, and once you've immersed yourself there, then you can have a conversation that makes sense. So you're so right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to share this video and like, comment, and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at New You Well. Until next time, stand tall in your power. And remember, your belief in yourself is your superpower.